trying to get my nervousness off. Yeah, right. <laughs> so good evening and welcome to the Commonwealth Club. You can find the Commonwealth Club online at commonwealthclub.org, on Facebook and Twitter, and on the club's YouTube channel. I'm retired Superior Court Judge Ladaris Cordell, your moderator for the program, and it's now my pleasure to introduce tonight's distinguished guest, Reverend Jesse Jackson, renowned activist, founder and president of Rainbow Push Coalition. Reverend Jackson is one of America's foremost civil rights, religious, and political figures. For more than five decades, from working with the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to his own two presidential campaigns and beyond, Reverend Jackson has played a pivotal role in virtually every movement for empowerment, peace, and social justice. On August 9th, 2000, President Bill Clinton awarded Reverend Jackson the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian honor. Reverend Jackson began his activism as a student in the summer of 1960, seeking to desegregate the local public library in his hometown of Greenville, South Carolina. In 1965, he became a full-time organizer for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and was soon appointed by Dr. King to direct the Operation Breadbasket Program. In December 1971, Reverend Jackson founded Operation Push, which event eventually became the Rainbow Push Coalition to expand educational, business, and employment opportunities for the disadvantaged and people of color. And in 2018, as this country grapples with polarization and increased threats of violence against social and political leaders, various ethnic groups, and the media, is it still possible for Americans to lessen the heated rhetoric and bridge divides? What are the possibilities for America to be inclusive and for all of us to find common ground across lines of race, culture, class, gender, and belief? So today, we're going to have a conversation about the promise of America with a man who has been called the conscience of the nation. Please welcome the Reverend Jesse Jackson. All right. So I, I'm delighted to be in conversation with you this evening, Reverend Jackson, as we discuss the state of America's promise to immigrants, to communities of color, to our children, to the poor, the underrepresented, to the middle class, to our democracy, and to the international community. So let's begin. All right. <laughs> we have much to cover and not much time to do it. All right, Reverend Jackson, Frederick Douglass, Shirley Chisholm, and you were African-American candidates for president from a major political party. Douglas received a single roll call vote at the 1888 Republican Convention in Chicago. Chisholm sought the Democratic nomination in 1972 in Miami Beach, and you, in your 1984 and 1988 presidential campaigns, now get this folks, won a total of 16 state contests and millions of votes, making you the first viable African-American candidate for president. Now, when you ran, there was no social media presence to speak of. Today, it's all about Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and more. Compare, if you will, your experience running for the presidency in 1988 with what you observed in the 2016 presidential campaign. What's in store for us in 2020 in that race, and can things get any worse? <laughs> Things can get worse, but then they need not. Uh, I was driven by a quest for personal dignity in public policy. In 1960, when I uh, came home from college, I had to do a speech with 25 annotated bibliographies, and I went to the Colored Library, and Mrs. Smith said, uh, we don't have this many books, but my friend, the Central Library, will let you use her books. So I ran there, and she told me I, I had to wait seven days. I said, just two of us in the library. She said, the seven days. The police said, you heard what she said. I went outside and I cried. And I said, this summer, I plan to use this library. And that was five years after Dr. King had emerged in Montgomery. And seven classmates and I, we were arrested that summer trying to use a public library. So it was a quest for personal dignity. Couldn't use a library in Greenville, South Carolina. Couldn't use 
uh, restaurants in Greensboro, North Carolina, and he couldn't vote. My father, second world war vet, said to sit behind lots of POW's dignity. And then as I learned what was happening, I began to fight. These were matters of public, public policy. And so in 84, uh, we thought we had a chance to win in Chicago. We called the Chicago Fest boycott because Jane Brown, had not, Jane Brown had not been very kind to us. And so in the middle of that thrust, we heard that, that Mondale and Ted Kendall were coming to town to defeat us in the primary Democrats, you know. So we sent them a telegram signed by Willie Brown and signed by Mrs. King and a number of us. Please don't interfere with our ability to become mayor of Chicago. A big deal after the 68 explosion there. And um, they said, we have to come back. Our friends are there. So Kennedy came for Jane Byrne, Mondale came for Daly. And I said, somebody needs to challenge them in the primary. I asked Manny Jackson, would he do it? Manny said, I would like to, but I've been in public service so long, I must make some money for my family. I said, Andy Young, would he do it? Andy said, well, Andy was uniquely qualified. He had been Dr. King's right-hand person. He had been congressperson, UN, mayor. That's Andrew Young. Uh -huh. and, and he wouldn't do it. In the meantime, people started saying, run, just run. They, they were, it, was a, it was a breakthrough. It was a breakthrough among people yearning for something, for somebody. So the long story short, we, we burst forth, learning the process. And I learned even then there are certain timeless, changeless values in changing times. I want to run A for equal and adequate protection of the right to vote. That's a simple proposition. Free Mandela, which was at that time difficult because he was considered on America's terrorist list. But we, we argued for a, a let's talk Middle East policy as opposed to a no talk policy. And to stop uh, drugs from coming in, jobs from going out. So we took several basic premises and we ran. And people began to respond. It was a glorious moment. Amazing. So what do you think is in store for us in 2020, just in terms of the rhetoric, the tenor? We have more access to vehicles of communication. Right. But we must drive the media by what we say, not just be driven by what's available to us. And my sense is that if you use the media for life over death, healing and hope over hurt and hate, it's, it's a good, they're good mediums. But you, they can be used for the wrong reasons. What happened on Facebook, for example, the last campaign where there was an attempt to put uh, to challenge privacy rights. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that was an attempt to, not attempt, but to, to, to troll and to, in fact, help determine the outcome of an election through that process. We must also put checks and balances on all this, this new media. But I think in the end of the day, whoever is running must have, must kind of grip with principles that are more the moral center than left or right. I mean, left and right is two sides of the same coin that results in one part of two names. The moral center is to the left of that. You know, in slavery time, bad guys said, treat them as you want to. Good guys said, be kind to them. Abolition say, end that system. It had to go beyond what two systems were. And today, there's no reason why we cannot have free public education for colleges. We're, we're able to do that. That's a fight. It's, it's the right fight. Uh, to be the idea of having babies locked up on the border uh, is, so disgraceful uh, to have the U.S. Army threatening to take on a border babies. I mean, Jesus was a border baby, if you will. It's so morally disgraceful. And, and so the values that we need to argue for do not depend upon Facebook and Google uh, and Microsoft, as it were. It depends upon the will of the leader to accept responsibility for putting forth a vision and then it can make people better off. So it, it was 1968. Dr. King had been assassinated, and Ralph Abernathy assumed the leadership of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference at CLC. At that time, you were in charge of Operation Breadbasket, and that was an SCLC initiative to monitor companies' treatments of African Americans and to organize boycotts for fair hiring practices. But friction developed between you, the young upstart, and Abernathy, the establishment leader, such that you left to form Operation Push, People United to Serve Humanity. Now, fast forward to 2018. 
We just completed the midterm elections in which the Democrats' blue wave took the House, while the Republicans' red wall kept control of the Senate. And now there looms a fight on the Democrat side between self-described progressives, the young upstarts, and establishment Democrats over who will be the next Speaker of the House. So talk to us about your experience as the upstart back in the day and give us your view about the current situation among Democrats as they move to take charge of the House in January. Is this a case of Democrats misbehaving or is it a case of Democrats behaving? Should the newbies challenge leadership or should they shut up, listen and learn from the elders or is there some in between? Should I leave now? <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, actually the tension in part was because we were I was in Chicago, we was in Atlanta, 700 miles apart. And some tensions developed. <clears throat> and we formed another organization with the same throats out of Chicago. We maintained a close personal relationship. We did not let it get ugly. Because I was clean keenly with it when Mandela and uh, uh, his uh, law partner began in 1946. They didn't form something. They, they joined the ANC youth movement. They, they built up on what was already there. Because why well, start from zero when I show those of them what you can build? And so I would say to any younger generation, there's nothing new. Take the best of what exists and, 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 and be transformative. For example, if the, if the issue today is livable wages, if the issue is uh, women's right to self-determination, if the issue is less nuclear weapons and end nuclear war, if the issue is stop being draconian on our immigration policy. If, if, if those issues matter to you, you should build up on that, need not start anew. And that's why I think it's, it's smart for Democrats to spend more time on issues that matter, that, that embrace all of us, than arguing about whether or not uh, uh, Nancy Pelosi should not, not be there because of her age. Mandela came out jail, he was 72. It was, not, it was direction, not age. If, if she were against Planned Parenthood, if she were against the protected right to vote, that's a, a legitimate argument. Arguing she's 70 and you have fought, you fought because you can't, you can't be 39 any longer. And you ain't fought the one yet. I mean, that, that's, I mean, that's a bogus argument because at the end of the day, we must have a one big tent for all involved and none are locked out. To build some argument for locking people out based on age, then come right back in the next day. I, I want to vote for me. Uh, I, I support seniors. Well, if you support seniors, then seniors can be leaders. And, and often, Dr. King was 26. He was a young leader. But he came out of the NAACP. So I, I am very much toward building upon that which is now. I think Democrats, given the threats we are facing today. We do well to address what ails the people externally, not just them internally. For example, you see 11 Jewish people shot down in cold blood on a Saturday morning. The president not talking about his hair blowing in the wind. You look at the people shot and the president's response is, Suppose the security guard that had her gun. What can you do with a semi-automatic weapon and a gun if somebody is that sick and that loaded with, with these weapons? Uh, you look at Charlottesville and you see equating civil rights protesters with these anti-Semitic racist uh, confederates and you dismiss it. We need people to address those issues that matter to the most people need health care now. People need adequate education now. Jobs that pay now. Respect based upon their person, not based upon anything else. We're, we're a multicultural, multi-educational society, multiracial society, those who embrace those values, if they're 18 or 80, embrace them. Because some young people don't make sense, and some do. That's some right. old people don't make sense, and some do. That's right. So you have to judge people based upon mm -hmm. direction and vision. 
not based on any other false premise. Can I get an amen on that? Sure. So, Reverend Jackson, in 2013, the conservative majority of the United States Supreme Court in Shelby County versus Holder gutted a key provision of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And since then, several states have just come up with creative ways to suppress the vote. Interesting fact, 99 bills designed to suppress the votes of people of color were introduced last year in 31 state legislatures. So I was stunned, and I've been around a long time, but I was stunned by the blatant efforts to suppress the votes of blacks, Latinos, and Native Americans in the midterms. How can America keep its promise to preserve our democracy if we can't be certain that our voices will be heard? With so much at stake in the midterms, only 47% of eligible voters even bothered to cast their ballots, and that was a 50-year high. So how do we get more people to vote? Should voting be regulated by the federal government rather than by the states? How do we do that? How do we ensure our you voice? You covered a lot of territory there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think there should be a unified national voting process, not a state's rights vote. So that should be federal and unified. You can have one, we have 50 states separate and unequal elections on election day. So in New York and Pennsylvania and Michigan, you can only vote one day on Tuesday. In Georgia, you may have 30 days of pre-registration. I mean, all, it's all over the place. Matter of fact, in 19, in 2000, Gore uh, was on the verge of beating uh, Bush, and the, the Supreme Court intervened and gave the state the power to determine the winner. So what they did was they uh, stopped the count. Mm -hmm. Bush had 534 votes, but 27,000 votes, most of black and devout counted, not been counted. The state determined out the common election. I don't support states' rights in voting. They can't trust it. In the last election, Hillary Clinton won by three million votes. You have a one person vote, one person one vote democracy, so you don't. Hillary Clinton won the election. Hillary Clinton won the election. Hillary Clinton won the election. It should have been another. <laughs> and, and so I'm, 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 I'm amazed at how many people, uh, some I have this animus toward her, if she had just done X or Y. Given the amount of international uh, intervention and invasion in the process, given the amount of, of schemes of gerrymandering and undercutting, uh, she had a three million surplus. Kennedy be Nixon by 112,000 votes, less than one vote per precinct. Uh, Nixon beat Humphrey by 500,000 votes. She won by three million votes. So to, to some, it takes effort to me to diminish what she did do against those, if, if any of those had had those odds, the odds of Russian intervention, the odds of manipulating Facebook, if any of them had, had those odds, none of them would have won. And so I think we, we would do well not to ever fall off the line of diminishing what she did against the odds she did it against. Uh, <laughs> the other thing that happened during this season, uh, in the darkest hours, when it's real dark, the stars are most apparent. So with the gloom and doom around the kind of things that Trump had done and promised to do, when the election was lost, Americans didn't run and hide. We turned our pain to power. The pain we felt the night of November 8th became a, a wake-up call as opposed to a go-to-sleep call. So Trump was installed one day, a million-plus women marched the next. Those women marched. They went home and registered, voted, ran, and won. Part of what makes America great is the right to fight for the right on a rather predictable time schedule. Uh, <laughs> the, in the darkest hour, out of the blue sky comes some guy named Beto O'Rourke from Texas, who ran with a kind of strength and vigor and vitality and appearance that makes him 
high for, for 2020 consideration. Who was here six months ago? Out of that dark season comes a Gillum in Florida, a black guy in Florida. Yes, ran a, a, a race, and each of those races put on a million new voters, therefore a million new jurors. Out of the race comes to Stacey Abrams in Georgia, who won the race, really. But she's running against, not just like she's running against the Secretary of State, who was the referee, school-keeping timekeeper. So, so, I, so here we have in the doc, we have a black lieutenant governor in in, um, in Illinois, a uh, black Jewish coalition, J.B. Pritzker, and an African American woman, an African American lieutenant governor, in Virginia, uh, in Michigan, in, uh, uh, in 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 New Jersey. So I see in the in the darkness, I see the lights uh, coming on everywhere and it gives me inspiration for 2020. Wow. One important way that America has kept its promise of freedom and equality for all is with an independent judiciary. So the courts have been the salvation for women, the criminally accused, the poor, people of color. Groundbreaking decisions by the U.S. Supreme Court and its segregation, public schools, public accommodations, abolished the ban on interracial marriage, legalized same-sex marriage, and established procedural protections in our criminal justice system. We've always been able to rely on our courts when all else failed. But now, the independence of our judiciary is being threatened by the Trump administration. So much so that recently, Chief Justice Roberts made a rare public statement about the importance of preserving judicial independence. Now, there have been personal attacks against judges whose rulings this president disfavors, and there are a record number of federal judges whose qualifications are either suspect or whose judicial philosophies align with ultra-conservative views who've been confirmed to lifetime appointments on the federal courts. Now, my question to you is with a U.S. Supreme Court majority that is solidly in the conservative camp, does all of this now mean that we are, can no longer turn to the courts for our salvation? How do we counter these unprecedented attacks on our courts? We cannot turn to the courts solely. But that same court rule, blacks had no rights, whites were bound to respect. We didn't give up then. Uh, that same court rule in 1896, legal, legal apartheid, legal segregation, that same court against the odds, trying to rule in 54, apartheid was illegal. So it's been a struggle against the courts down through the years that were not, the courts did not stop us from sitting in in 1955. The courts did not stop us from going to jail in 1964. It didn't stop us from marching in 65. And so uh, I, I tend not to look for why we can't do it, why we must. It always starts by, as long as we have the right to fight for the right, nothing can stop us. No court will stop us. Our quest for public company, uh, I look in the, the, the New South, when Alabama plays Georgia for the big game in Atlanta, and there's Wallace on the one hand saying, I'll block the doors forever. And there's Maddox with his ax handle saying blacks will never have the right to vote. And, my, and Dr. King about six blocks away. And these kids on the, on the field, uh, uniform color, not skin color, direction, not complexion, playing ball against the stands, fans full of uh, people of multiracial, multicultural. They could not stop that America. I think an America is coming forth for our future. <coughs> Trump can turn back the clock. He can't, he can't turn back time. We're not going back. We're, he's leaving, we're not. Right on. Right. The, the right to vote has been injured, injured somewhat by removing preclearance, so much so, while it may have been aimed at African Americans, Judge, we got n nine million more Democrats voted last week than Republicans, and yet we lost the Senate yeah. because of gerrymandering. When we got the right to vote in 1965, I should never forget we thought, well, we finally have the right to vote and the burden's on us to register. We didn't understand gerrymandering, annexation at large, role purging. We didn't understand those manip manipulations. In 65, African-Americans could not vote uh, in the Maine and the South. 
White women couldn't serve on juries. 18 year olds were serving in Vietnam could not vote. You couldn't vote on college campuses. You couldn't vote bilingually. But we never stopped fighting, moving in the cracks. I say cracks advisedly because one morning I was walking in, uh, down the street from my house, and there was a broken sidewalk. And, and the brokenness of sidewalks, uh, some grass and the flower was blossoming. And I stopped and often stopped and searched for a sermon someplace. <laughs> and uh, that cement was designed to suppress all the, dirt, all the dirt under it. Right. But it was a crack in it. And a little water and a little dirt and some sunshine, out of that crack came the stem and the flower uh, and, and fermentation. It, it, the extent to which we have that, that will to survive against the odds, then nothing can stop us. Dr. Howard Thurman, who did much of his later ministry here in, in San Francisco, described that when he was a, uh, a youngster in Santa Florida where uh, 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 Trayvon Martin was killed, uh, that his feet had a kinship to the sand, that he didn't have any shoes on so his feet could touch the sand. And he says, this is beach nut, this is juicy fruit, you can tell what the flavor of chewing gum was because it's... <laughs> and uh, it's his, his two older sisters would not let him grow up. He was taller at, at six feet, he was about 185 pounds. And while walking to the Blackberry Briar Patch one day, um, a little green two-inch snake jumped out of the bed, and they, they, they froze. And he stood there and put his foot on the snake. And they pulled up on him. He was all of a sudden their big brother. <laughs> he could protect them. He could provide security for them. Right. And, and he hit his foot on that, on that two-inch snake. He had an, an 85-pound snake that weighed a pound. And he kept pressing the snake, and he finally felt a little a little throb on his foot, and he kept pressing, because he had found his manhood, and he kept pressing, and then and all of a sudden, he reached for the mistake, dashed in the bushes. <laughs> Against the odds on your back, mm-hmm. if you maintain the draft to survive, when the, when the door does come open, shoot through it. That's what happened in the election last, last week. In spite of these schemes of disenfranchisement, we took the house back. Mm. And, and that means NASA Pelosi and I has a platform and a voice and check and balance power and subpoena power and hope. So against tremendous odds, we must be odds busters and, and dream makers. We must be odds busters and dream makers to survive. So to change the subject a little bit, the, the strong coalition that existed into the 1970s between African Americans and Jews, a coalition that was in the forefront of the civil rights struggle of the 60s no longer exists. Um, When Louis Farrakhan uses anti-Semitic speech, I don't hear African American leaders denouncing him and his words. Rather, I hear things like, yeah, he says bad things about the Jews, but he stands up for black folks. Well, in my world, there's no but on that subject. So this year um, has marked a stunning uptick in incidents of anti-Semitism in this country. So my question to you, you've had your ups and downs with the Jewish community. Where do you stand on this subject today? Should we strive to rekindle that strong black Jewish coalition that once existed? And if so, how do we do that? I think in many ways it was never as free as the media projected to be freed. I mean, through all of the tough times, we supported Israel's right to exist with security. There were tensions around Israel's relationship with South Africa as we fought to free South Africa. We we managed to to handle that as well. Uh, You look at the votes in the U.S. Congress on labor and public education, we're essentially the same place on climate change with the same place. I think sometimes we'll take a, a tree, a leaf and act as if it's a limb. That's fake news. I think we cannot afford to be a part. When you, when you look at, uh, at the nine people killed in the church in Charleston, 11 killed in church, in, temple in, in, in Pittsburgh, 
That's a message that will not go away. The, the Smyrna, Goodman, and Trinity buried in the, the soil in Philadelphia, Mississippi. The Reagan stood and, and, and said, we're, 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 we're back. Uh, our relationship is, is profoundly deep and its kinship is non negotiable We can't negotiate this run of good machine of blood. We, we can support our need to, to face the forces of radical race and anti racism and anti Semitism. So, in some sense, we don't have no any place to go. Sometimes we have a false sense of security. But I tell you, lest we, when we come together as brothers and sisters, which is our option, or we die apart as fools, my sense is we are together. When we were, we were marching together in Charlottesville, when the other high was killed, we were marching together in, in 63, marching together in 65. Uh, when uh, Willie Brown won in, in, in San Francisco, we were together. When Tom Bradley won in uh, LA, we were together. Uh, when uh, Mayor Jackson ran and won in Atlanta, and uh, when David Inks in New York, so these coalitions that invariably bring us together don't get the kind of uh, focus, as it were, the, some one discordant voice. I cannot measure Jewish relations by the fact when I opened my campaign, the very day I opened it, the Jewish Defense League uh, cut off a hog and put it on the doorsteps of my, where I lived. That's not Jewish people, that's, that's a, an edge. But we must be more mature than that. It seems to me we cannot afford to allow leaves to become limbs in our struggle to survive. Wow. A, a few years ago, you stirred up a hornet's nest in Silicon Valley's tech companies by insisting that they cough up their reports on racial, gender, and ethnic diversity in the workplaces. Then in April of this year, you and Rainbow Push Coalition sent an email to 25 large technology companies, including Google, Facebook, Tesla, and Oracle, calling on them to release information on their hiring practices, board diversity measures, and employee retention statistics, in addition to keeping their latest diversity data. Have they coughed it up? And are these companies helping to keep America's promise of equal opportunity? Not nearly as much as they should. They're all stuck at the 2% level for, for the most part. We began this drive led in part by Butch Wing, my co-partner who is here in the Greater Bay Area, uh, <coughs> and Reverend Joe Bryant. Of 187 board members, white men, 36 women, three blacks and one Latino. We begin to challenge them on boards of directors. No shortage of talent, shortage of opportunity. When Ken uh, uh, from uh, went to, to join Facebook, he had the most, most maturity and most capacity to serve, to allow him to serve, or uh, to get uh, uh, Deborah Lee on the board of Twitter, or uh, Jim Bell, who used, to, who used to be the chief operating officer of Boeing on the board of Apple. They brought, they brought something to the table as Jack Robinson did to baseball, or uh, as Russell did to, to basketball. There, there's no talent shortage, there's no opportunity shortage. And so much for their being new, they, they're about 15 years old. They're worse than General Motors and Ford and Chrysler. So I can't, I can't make up age or religion. They're, they're, they're young and exclusionary in their policies, and they have a false comfort zone with other white people. And somehow we are a multiracial, multicultural society. And when we come from that talent pool, good things come our way. Now there are now about 20 African Americans on boards and there are more Latinos on boards, more women on boards because we have made it vis a visible issue. Then now the next level, more blacks, women, and people called in the C-suites, operational stuff that takes place every day. And then the professional services, lawyers, agents in marketing, and then ultimately access to capital. You can have the, the best mind uh, and the best idea. Whites can still get more money on an idea than blacks can get on collateral. I said whites can get more money on an idea than blacks and browns can get on, 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 on collateral. 
one of my nephews, Lawrence, who grew up in Oakland, was a PhD in um, engineering mechanics, came out of Stanford. All of his classmates went straight to Silicon Valley. He went straight home. Same degree in higher grades. He now teaches at MIT. He would, would have been logical to have a place in Silicon Valley. It was learned for him. And what do blacks and Latinos represent and women represent? Market, money, talent, location. Racism and sexism are unscientific, immoral, and limiting. There's no scientific basis for us in a woman there's less capacity to fly a plane than a man. Women don't pick up, people don't pick up planes and run across the mountains on the damn plane on their back. <laughs> women, can, women can fly planes and can be surgeons. There's nothing any of us can do, others of us cannot do with something called opportunity. And why are we so good at football? When you look at, I don't, I don't want to call the 49ers, let me forget it. Say, say the Warriors, let some of you guys. <laughs> Uh, well, if it's football, if the Giants play the 49ers, why are there 80% black ball players on both sides of the ball? Uh, what about those sports areas, football, basketball, baseball, track, golf, that make us so successful? Whenever the playing field is even, rules are public, goals are clear, Referees are fair and the school is transparent. We can make it. When the playing field is uneven, if, 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 uh, if, if blacks have to run 12 yards for a first down and whites have to run eight yards because they inherited some yards, <laughs> that wouldn't work either. Uh, but on the, in those areas of life where we have, where rules are just, we have better outcomes. But where you put inheritance over effort, uh, effort and excellence means a lot. Inher inheritance and access means more. I say effort and excellence means, and hard work means a lot. Mm -hmm. Inheritance and access means more. So when do you, you wake up next year, before the years of African Americans been in this country, before the anniversary next year. 246 years in slavery, woke up one day free but unequal, with no compensation for 246 years of work without wages. Then we, we were assets in slavery and became threats with the right to vote. 5,000 lynchings led by the previous slave masters without protection under the law. Against the law, we go from the balcony when Dr. King was killed in Memphis, back to the White House, Barack president, against those odds we're still transforming America. And it, it, it seems to me it is that hope and that belief in the future against all odds that makes us great. You, you, you cannot figure out a way to survive, you cannot figure out a way to succeed unless you maintain the power of hope. I'm gonna give you a number. Okay. So the number is 46. That's the number of American hostages whose freedom you have secured. 46. <clears throat> so just, just for a quick recap, in 1983, you traveled to Syria to secure the release of a captured American pilot, Navy Lieutenant Robert Goodman. In June 1984, you negotiated the release of 22 Americans held in Cuba. On the eve of the 1991 Persian Gulf War, you traveled to Iraq, met Saddam Hussein, and secured the release of 20 Americans. And in April 1999, during the Kosovo War, you traveled to Belgrade to negotiate the release of the US POW captured on the Macedonian border while patrolling with the UN peacekeeping unit. So my, my first question to you, why did you do that? And secondly, what is your secret? <laughs> How do you do that? I have one, one unfulfilled ambition. What's that? Like go to Washington, save America from Trump. <laughs> 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 no, I think that by, first of all, I think leaders must see the world 
through a door, not through a keyhole. And so often we see the world through that door and we, we, we see limited, we think limited and we act in limited ways. Somehow uh, it is the door that we see the globe, not just the map. And what I found in, in working that there's a significant part of the world that's uh, half of all human beings are Asian. Half of them are Chinese. One is African, one fourth Nigerian. Two thirds of our neighbors next door, not back next door, speak Spanish. English, English is a minority language in our hemisphere. The more Indians than they are, Americans and Russians combined. In that world, most people are yellow, brown, black, Christian, poor, non, white, young, and don't speak English. In that world, each time I stepped outside of my world, to what, at that time it was called non-aligned nations, for example, I believe if I could get to Saddam Hussein, I mean, at that time, if I could get to uh, uh, Saddam, Saddam Hussein, really, I could convince him there was more to his advantage to let them go than to keep them. And so we were able to convince him. But whether I was in Iraq, or Syria, or Yugoslavia, or Africa, whenever we found a country where we, 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 most people were poor, we underestimated the impact of their religious, leadership, religious leadership in that country. And uh, intelligence deficits, and by arrogance pushed them away, they were, they were really open looking for something. I tried to provide that something, a bridge to America. I should never forget when we brought Goodman, R R Reagan had said, don't go to Syria because you can't get him. Uh, you don't, don't know what you're doing, you may get somebody hurt. But if you do go, because you have the right to go, bring him back. <laughs> so I take that deal. <laughs> so we were able to convince Assad to finally let him go. And we, we brought him back. And Reagan, on his word, he had a big White House reception. His, his full cabinet was there. And three things stand out in my mind. When, I, when we brought, when we finally convinced Assad after three days, let him go. Assad said, Reverend Jackson, I won't let him go, but I have to go through my cabinet. And it's Christmas time, and they're all over Europe on vacation. I said, if I had to hire one lawyer, it would be you. So I want you, Mr. Mr. Lawyer, let my guy go. He did. The second thing I remember, I was waiting for the press to ask me some profound question about foreign policy. We had thought through. I had the sense that if, I, if our foreign policy is built upon international law, human rights, self-determination, economic justice, and, and shared security. Those principles are abiding principles. And so I, I had a sense of what to do. And then personality plays a role in, in, in convincing people. And so the press asked me, Reverend Jackson, who paid the hotel bill? <laughs> Never, I had no, got no credit for thinking. We did this thing 10 different times, you know. We, we never thought, we always were lucky. The last point was, it seems to me, we brought him back to the White House. President Reagan said, well, you, Reverend Jackson, I tell you, you can't argue with success. Congratulations. I said, thank you, sir. He said, now, what can I do? What can I do? He said, well, what do you do different than, than what my guys have done? I said, first, I tried. <laughs> uh, oh. Oh. What, what is, what is I said, secondly, no, 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 did, did, I, did I try? I said, but he said, now, what can I do for you? It's different. I said, what you can do for me is call Assad and say thank you. Now, I'm not, I'm not asking for my money for a grant or for some kind of, and said, we had, we had a no talk policy to it, sir, at the time, a no talk policy. And he asked me in a very big room, he called it, they called Assad. They talked, they never stopped talking. Talking matters. But they talk, 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 then shoot, shoot, shoot. And they talked, and they were kind of embarrassed not to talk to each other. And Assad was happy because he was recognized by America for releasing a soldier. Reagan was happy his guy was back home. You find what's mutually beneficial, and you build upon that. To me, that's the key to any good negotiation, is find out what's mutually beneficial to both parties involved. That's why the climate agreement in Paris was so significant. Everybody had a common interest, and the whole world saw it. 
except today's uh, commander. But the whole world saw the value in, in having climate change to a climate agreement in Paris, which we must now restore under the leadership of Nancy Pelosi. We must restore the climate agreement. Right, absolutely. <clears throat> Would you have liked to have been an ambassador, and if so, to what country? No, I had the opportunity to be an ambassador to South Africa at some point. But I, I wanted to keep one foot close enough to government Thanks. and one foot out to be a change agent. I didn't want to be in a position where the government could fire me. <laughs> I, I, and I said, in all due respect to our government, I just wanted to the freedom to move uh, and to be supportive of our government on its best days and challenge on its worst days. And, I, and, I, and I, now, at my age now, would I take that position uh, on another president? Yes, but not, not now. Because <laughs> I find myself disagreeing with my, with my president too much, so I couldn't. I'd be fired the first month. <laughs> <laughs> So let, let's change up the pace before we get to our audience questions. I, I'm going to do a lightning round. So uh, a lot of Democrats have already making noise about running for president in 2020. And on the Republican side, uh, Trump seems to, right now to have no apparent challengers. So I'm going to give you the names of possible Democratic contenders. And I want you to give them a grade, A, B, C, D, or an F, <laughs> for how each, if elected president, would keep America's promise to preserve our democratic institutions and bring us together, okay? Not fair, but go on. Of course it's fair. <laughs> all right, so, all right, so Kamala Harris. High grade. She has the, the integrity, the experience, and the touch that gives her high marks. I mean, to, to be a state attorney general in California, to be a U.S. senator from California, an African-American woman, she's, she's conquered enough odds with grace to get high grades. Elizabeth Warren. Double A. <laughs> I mean, it, it, we have a consumer protection agency now because of Elizabeth Warren. Elizabeth Warren was, they, they refused to uh, recognize her department, so she got mad and became a U.S. senator. She has all the right stuff. She chose not to run against Hillary, which was her choice. But there's, there's nothing in government. The government is determined by the vision. Of the, she has a great vision. I, I, I give her high grades. All right. This, he said he was thinking about running. Kanye West. <laughs> As an entertainer, A. As an entertainer, an A. Yeah. That's, 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 that's what he does. Right. I, I, fair I, I respect that. Yeah, fair enough. Like the, each of us must find what, what I like to stay in our lane. <laughs> really, I, I, I have high regard for him. Last time we met with, with Trump, and he went through his thing. He came back a few years later and said he felt he had been used. He, he, he didn't like it. And, and that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Bernie Sanders. High grades. But I really think that Bernie has the vision. I think there's a generation just beneath Bernie, uh, whether it is uh, 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 from uh, New Jersey, Booker, and, and Kamala Harris, and, and Beto O'Rourke. I think there's a generation that's coming now that uh, we must, I think some of us must lend them our shoulders and our support. A uh, couple other people have thrown their names out. Michael Avenatti. Aye. Aye. Uh, Cory Booker. A. <laughs> uh, Stanford football player. Yep. Good grades, very articulate, very driven. Road scholar. Road scholar and all that. So he has the right stuff. Maxine Waters. <laughs> Maxine speaks the most truth to power. She may not make it through the primaries. <laughs> but, Maxine, but what Maxine's what she's going to do, however, in, in her lane, she's going to become chair of the finance committee, uh, banking and finance. And Wall Street is already trying to adjust to the storm that's coming. 
You know, sometimes a, a, a good coach looks at players, and the coach is judged by where they, where they fit, what they do well. And uh, sometimes when people are as audacious as Maxine is, they might not fit here, they fit there better. What she does as an advocate, most Congress people find a place in the Congress. She finds a space outside of it, and, and, and I hope that she maintains the coverage it takes to maintain that space, because that space is difficult to occupy, because you don't have to, you don't have to, if you're on the committee and you vote the silent committee, you have lots of protection. Right. Maxine would go out on, on, on the wing and fly by herself against the headwinds. I have the highest respect for Maxine. There's nothing she can't do, including be a good president, I might add. I mean, the bar been, has lowered, been lowered so low. <laughs> but I, but my, 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 I, I, I judge her high as a leader. Leaders at their best don't follow opinion polls. They mold opinion. She's an opinion molder. Got it. That makes her different. Okay, and last one, uh, you. Did my best on my best day. You know, I, a couple of things about it. <laughs> I think I made contribution in, in that lane. Oh, yeah. In '84, we got three million, three and a half million voters and 400 delegates, and that seemed off. I get 48 percent, you get 49, you take 100. Mm -hmm which would undercut the spirit of my 48. So I said, this is not right. So it was something called winner take all. So in 88, we got 7 million votes and 1,200 delegates. If I got 48% of the vote, I got that many delegates. So it's called, you know, the, the, the um, proportionality. That seemed not like it didn't matter much, but, but, but 2008, 20 years later, when Barack ran against Hillary, what struck me the most about Barack as a younger person, uh, who in my son's generation, my children's generation, he, uh, he said one day he was watching us debate at, at Columbia, debate against uh, Mondell and Hart. And he said, a student that I run and didn't make that much sense to him at that time, he said, but this thing can happen. That's one of the gratifying features that you plant seeds that may That's bring right. forth trees in the hoops. Right shade you may never sit. So I, I, I find joy in that. But a, a step beyond that, in 2008, when he ran against the odds, Hillary won California, barely. Texas, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. On the eight to four rule, she would have been the nominee. But we had democratized democracy. He didn't win California, he kept his chef delegates. So the eight, eight rules made his even the playing field for him. And so I saw the, the joy of that, and I think that he did so well. I, I must say that uh, you have to judge him not just by his running ability, but how tough the headwinds were. He lost a lot of state legislatures because people ran against race and never called it race. I mean, there was a lot of stuff that made us lose ground when Barack was president. Um, when he came in office, we lost 800,000 jobs the month before. Mm -hmm. Net gain of jobs every month for eight years, some more, some less. Uh, he came in office, 26 million Americans with health care, most of them for the first time. And they were so devious until they called health care Obamacare. They put a, a label on it that they considered to be poison. And I met some women in Kentucky. They really wanted affordable health care. They didn't want Obamacare. <laughs> they, wanted omelet. they didn't want the eggs. They were all confused. Uh, then he brought, renewed, renewed the connection with Cuba in our hemisphere. Mm -hmm. He was able to make a, a loan to bail out the automotive industry. Uh, the climate change environment uh, law in, uh, in, 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 in Paris. Tremendous contribution. No hint of scandal. The, 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 the dignity of his family alone was worth the investment in Barack. Sure. I think, I think about, I think about his mother-in-law raising those two daughters 
in the big house. It reminds me of Moses raising him inside Pharaoh's house. I watched the dignity of those girls in the development. Watch uh, Michelle, who am, along with my daughter grew up together in Chicago, and to watch him do so well against such odds, uh, um, he makes my heart rejoice. That's right, all of us. Through. So we have time for a few questions from the audience. Reverend Jackson, you've been a powerful advocate for ending racism in the criminal justice system and for ending the death penalty. Do you have any counsel for, and I'm gonna change it a little bit. The question was for Governor Brown as he ends his tenure. Our mind is for counsel for Governor Newsom as he begins his governorship. One thing you can do is look at state contracts. If power distribution of state contracts women and people of color who may who often need access to capital and the inside track. That's a way to do it. The other one is that many of our youth uh, in this scientific age, uh, we, want, we should be having all over the state youth tech summits. So our, our kids can learn apps and codes and, and programming in their formative years. That includes those who are in jail. So, so many are in jail on nonviolent uh, offenses. Use some of that, that idle time to learn to come, they can go from jail with a trade to transportation to a job and reduce recidivism. I, I think there's no reason why we should be having to leave here and go to another country across the ocean to bring in. I, I'm, I'm always supporting B1 children because I think that we must keep our doors open. But you get to plow up with some B1 potentials right here in Oakland and San Francisco to get there. Our children can learn, will and must. And I think that has to be the, the foundation to it all. Given your long-standing activism for decades, what strategy do you recommend for us and people of goodwill to combat the craziness of this country? Part of what makes America great the right to fight for the right, to know what its promise is. Its promise is a multiracial society and multicultural. I mean, France for the French, and China for the Chinese, Japan for the Japanese, America for your tired, your poor, your whole masses, you yearn to breathe free. Something about that promise is America's uniqueness and, and greatness. Because it, 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 that sharing of ideas that makes all of us see the world differently and see it in, the, in, the, in, a, bigger, in, a, in a bigger place. And I would hope that in, 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 in years to come that we would know that. Uh, when I look at, uh, I, I went to a high school yesterday in uh, Seattle. I asked the students, uh, do you have a basketball team? And they screamed, they have state champions the last two years. I said, um, who's the captain? The captain stood up. I said, Captain, I said, how many days you guys practice? Five. I said, I said, six, all right, six. I said, what about Sunday? On our own. I said, I said, seven to me, seven days we practice. How many hours a day? Four. Well, sometime more, okay. I said, uh, you ever read you in practice? Look me out, crazy. I said, no. Have TV in practice? No. It looked like I'm really crazy now. I said, uh, can your girlfriend come to rehearse? Can you practice? Oh, no. I said, well, then, if you're sweating, you get real tired. You're real tired. You're going to sit down. You can't sit down. Why you can't sit down? You got to suck it up and keep running. Can you, all of us can dunk. I said, okay. I said, now, since, since we have a family meeting, I said, now, you study this six days a week. He know. So two hours a night, no. I said, I don't need any, 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 uh, any study on why you're not, if you're not careful, your legs will run you indoors, your mind will not keep you in. We should not working on the, against the odds, the poorest school in the state on demographics is the champion because it's the, what the priorities are. And so part of my sense is our children, we, we're fighting for, to motivate them to excellence and, and to have uncompromising standards and investment to make it happen. 
So, another question. If you were a 25-year-old activist today, where would you spend your time and focus? Oh, no. <laughs> You know, in part because it's situational. You know, you have to address life when you find it and, and deal with the cards that are, that, that are on the table that you must deal with. I, I in part, fought to use the public library because we were humiliated and couldn't use it. And probably fought to go to the theaters because we were the colors only. And fought, I fought the right to vote because my father came home from World War II and black and brown soldiers had to sit behind knots of POWs on American military bases. So I had to take it where, where I found it. This generation cannot find, cannot make an impact on public accommodation. We have that right to vote. We must obviously remove the this, this scheme to undermine the right to vote. But your generation must fight to do what? Reduce nuclear weapons. That's your generation's fight at 25. Uh, Students should vote, every 18 year old should graduate with a diploma in one hand and vote a card in the other. There are more 18 year olds than there are 81 year olds. Use that power. We didn't have that power 50 years ago. Uh, students should vote on the campus where they attend school, not where they come from. But if you're, gonna, if you're, you, if you're at the University of San Francisco, you're from New York, you should register and vote where you attend school and impact where you are. That's where you maximize your power. Uh, our agenda is very much the same as how, how do we use how do we use social media today to communicate in ways we couldn't talk to each other many years ago. I'm a strong advocate of social media, but 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 human beings must drive the message. The machine does not have the message. We must drive the message, and we must use the machine, not be used by it. Got it. So we come to the, the close of our conversation, we have time for one final question, and it's this. Uh, at the 1988 National Democratic Convention in Atlanta, where you were seeking the nomination, you gave a wonderful and rousing speech that you called Common Ground and Common Sense. So I would like to close our conversation um, with excerpts from that speech, words that are as relevant today as they were when you spoke those words 30 years ago. So would you do us the favor of reading some excerpts from that powerful speech to close our conversation? If I may, when I finish, ask the three questions from the audience. I want to ask the three. You want to ask them now? I'll ask the, at least three questions from the audience. Y'all so quiet, you scare me. <laughs> do you want to ask them now? No, All let right. me read this. These are the excerpts. Oh boy. <laughs> Wherever you are tonight, I challenge you to hope and to dream. Don't submerge your dreams. Even on drugs, dream of the day you're drug free. Even in the gutter, dream of the day that you'll be up on your feet again. You must never stop dreaming. Face reality. But don't stop with the way things are. Dream things as they ought to be. Dream. Face pain, but love, hope, faith, and dreams will keep your rise above the pain. And no one should look down on you, but sometimes mean people do. The only justification we have for looking down on someone is to stop and pick them up. You must not surrender. You may or may not get there, but just know that you're qualified and you hold on and hold out. You must never surrender. America will get better and better. Keep up alive. Keep up alive. Keep up alive. On tomorrow night and the beyond, keep hope alive. And uh, 22 years later, Barack was sworn in as president. <laughs> Did you have anything else? I'm just. A, oh, I saw a number of our friends tonight in the lobby uh, who may want to stay in touch with the Rainbow Push Coalition. We're, 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 we're building already for, for 2020, for 2020. Uh, uh, tech Push. Uh, 
41444. So if you want to stay uh, in contact uh, with PUSH, again, it's PUSH. This is what you text, P-U-S-H, 41444. Or JLJ. Right. 41444. So, I want you to join the organization. We have work to do. We, we have begun a great work this year. I'm so excited about what happened in Texas. Texas is a, is a blue state that votes red. <laughs> it's blue on its knees and its, and its makeup. But the, 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 the organized minority has more power than the, 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 the disgruntled majority. So if Texas, and I think what Beto has done, he has aroused a belief among the base. And one thing he did that I must say is it's personal, but it's gratifying. He called me one day. When I ran in 88, his father was one of our campaign managers. And I, I didn't make the connection. There's a picture on, somewhere on your, if Shella Davis is, Shella can tell you, with it. where is Shella Davis? On your, on your Facebook, the picture of Beto and I, and he was like 10 years old. <laughs> Where's Shelly Davis, a butch? Where, where are you guys? Come, come on, come on, Bush. That's fine. So he said Google, 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 Google Beto, Jesse Jackson, images. Okay. And, and uh, uh, that, 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 that campaign, his audacity and his freedom of going outside of the one part of two name deal. Uh, to, for Gillum that ran the race he ran in Florida. Another, those state, when, when, when the, Slave, ex-slave states rise up. They have the power to turn red to purple and purple to blue. And when it will all be better off, because there is a new South today. I grew up in the South. There's a, you couldn't have the Carolina Panthers and the Atlanta Falcons and the Dallas Cowboys behind the cotton curtain. You couldn't have uh, Nissan and Toyota in Mississippi behind the cotton curtain. You couldn't, have have, you couldn't have CNN in Atlanta behind the cotton curtain. You couldn't have Alabama and Georgia as the top, and Clemson as the top teams in the South. All the black players had to go North. So we are better, and, and so I, I know that it's a difficult time because we have such bad news every day when we're governed seen by whims and tweets. But we are a better nation than that. That's right. Uh, Mr. Trump represents something that, that will not stand the test of time. We will, we will survive what he represents. Maybe the good news is it's a wake-up call because there are those of you who did not vote or did not make a choice that was real in, in, two, in 16, and you who didn't vote, if you, were sitting, you elected him. Take that home with you. If, if you didn't vote... Uh, out of cynicism through your vote the way you elected him. So given that, and you mentioned the reneging all these people A's, because we, we have some tremendous talent mm -hmm. that will be competing early on. That's right. Beto and, and Corey and, and Kamala Harris and uh, Elizabeth Warren and, and, and a lot of people, and they're just, and they're just, they're just anxious. And I think that 18 year olds couldn't, couldn't vote in six to six to seven. They can't vote now. You can vote on college campuses, but you can now. So uh, one of the cruelest things in slavery, when, in the Hebrews when slavery in Egypt's land, is to make brick without straw, which is almost impossible. We had to make democracy without votes. Now we can vote. We can make real bricks. We can make real change. And let nothing break your spirit. Commonwealth, keep up alive. Love you guys. All right. That's good. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, thanks to Reverend Jesse Jackson. And we thank everyone here, as well as our audience on the radio, television, and the internet. I'm Judge Ladaris Cordell, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club, the place where you're in the know, is adjourned. Thank you all.